All right. So for our next topic, you know, we just covered um, things like um, the sense of scale and geological time scales and early earth and kind of why all that matters. And so what I want to do for this next little portion is kind of a somewhat introduction or maybe not introduction, but a review uh, for some of us, perhaps or a brand new thing for maybe some of us um, is talking about our position on the planet. So something that we use to consider to, or to describe, I should say, where we are on Earth is latitude. So that means the distance that we are from the equator. The equator is zero degrees. And so um, any numbers ascending from that and um, associated with north would be north of the equator. So for example, San Francisco is roughly 37 degrees north. Uh, but we also have, you know, the whole other half of the planet, and that is the southern hemisphere. And then that's you know, determining where we are from north to south. But then we also have longitude. So that determines where we are in relation to the prime meridian. And that essentially goes through Greenwich, London, or Greenwich, England, which is pretty close to London. Um, so, and that is in terms of west over here on the left or east. And y'all, there is no shame in having to write a compass that says and never eat shredded wheat. Sorry, there's with this um, software, I can't draw, but I always have to write compasses. I always have to say the alphabet when I'm alphabetizing things like there's absolutely zero shame in having to write a compass at the top of something to remind us of north, east, south, west. So that's just determining where we are on the planet. What's Another thing that we can do is further divide that into smaller units. So similar to like how we go from a yard to a foot to an inch, we can take a degree of either latitude or longitude and divide that into smaller units in terms of minutes and seconds. So one degree of latitude or longitude is equal to 60 minutes and one minute is equal to 60 seconds. And um, we'll have some practice in terms of um, doing some math alongside that um, in our labs coming up. So have no fear. If you're not totally getting that, hopefully we'll get it a little bit better um, in our labs coming up. So that's just a brief introduction with that. Another thing I wanna introduce us to or remind us of is the fact that our planet has a water cycle. I mean, we have a bunch of cycles on our planet, but the water cycle is the biggest thing in terms of oceanography, right? So for all intents and purposes, our whole planet is this closed system. So all the water on our planet is all the water that exists, right? So we have our oceans um, and a lot of evaporation happens from our oceans and that can go into our atmosphere and can condense in terms of clouds and precipitate either back straight back into the oceans or that moisture can be transported and then um, condensed and precipitated onto our land mass areas. Um, and there's several things that can happen once it's rained out or um, precipitated out into our land. It can be you know, frozen into ice, it can be sublimated back into the clouds, uh, it can infiltrate into our soil and then turn into groundwater um, or be runoff. You know, there's, there's a lot of different ways that the water can just really cycle through, hence the water cycle, right? So it's a nice little thing to remind ourselves of. And then lastly, it's good to give ourselves a sense of scale, right? We just talked recently on geologic time scales and how it's taken so long for our planet to become what it is now. It's also good to remind ourselves um, like how how much water is on our planet if we were to, you know, make it down or like condense it down into more tangible um, ideas this is what we would come up with, right? So the total water on our planet, if it was condensed down, could fit into a 55 gallon drum, about 53 gallons, one quart, one pint, and 13.6 ounces would be oceans and sea ice. And there's a huge difference between sea ice and land ice. And we'll talk further on that um, as we progress through the semester. 
Um, and then if we were to consider just the ice caps and glaciers, aka land ice, uh, that would only be one gallon, one pint, and 6.6 .6 ounces. And then if we were to consider groundwater, so everything that's underground, that's kind of infiltrated into our soils, that's only about the size of a bucket. So one quart and 11 ounces. And then <clears throat> going down further into our freshwater lakes would only be a small espresso cup. So a, a 0 0.6 ounces, that's less than a shot of alcohol you would get at a bar. And like, this part's wild to me. I mean, it's all wild to be quite honest with you, but freshwater lakes, you know, you think of like Lake Tahoe or Lake Shasta or Mammoth or Clear Lake, like all these massive lakes that maybe you've been to before are even like such so much smaller than in reality of like of where um, and and like how big everything is. It, it trips me out. But then we also have saline lakes and inland seas. So that would be like the Great Salt Lake or um, the Red Sea, you know, these really, or the Dead Sea, like these really salty, more inland areas. And that is once again, I mean, almost similar to that of Fresh Lakes, but a little bit smaller. And then we have soil moisture. So that kind of like uh, that, that small layer right at the at the edge um, i just listened to a podcast all about agriculture and talking about soil moisture and stuff and so that was you know that would only be a, like 0.35 ounces so only about the the size of a syringe and then the app the moisture that's in the atmosphere is only 0 0.07 ounces so that of an of an eyedropper which is wild because that includes all of our clouds and all of the humidity. If anyone's ever been to um, a really humid tropical place like Florida or the Caribbean or Hawaii, really, really humid places, but if it's, it still accounts for just such a small amount of water on our planet. And then finally, the freshwater rivers that exist on our planet is only 0 0.007 ounces, so the size of an eye of a needle. And some real world, world examples you can think about that would be like the Mississippi River, which is huge, the Missouri River, the Nile, the Amazon River, like these really massive water systems, again, are just still such a small amount of what is on our planet. And that's pretty wild to me. And then if we were to consider how all of that is distributed or the, the distribution of oceans anyway, um, over land versus water, the the contrasts are pretty striking. So starting here on the left hand side, I like to start with this one with the southern hemisphere here on the right and the northern hemisphere on the left. And take a moment to pause and like compare and contrast these two, right? Where do you see more blue? The southern hemisphere, right? There's so much more ocean in the southern hemisphere. In the top right, once again, do the same exercise. Consider looking at the Pacific Ocean versus the Atlantic Ocean, which one's bigger? Take a moment. The Pacific Ocean, yeah? Um, and here's the Indian Ocean, still pretty small in comparison to the other two. We have the Southern Ocean, and then we have the Arctic Ocean. And we all took the, the states and, and um, the states quiz and the worlds and, and oceans quiz, and I'm sure we all did excellent, but just to remind ourselves of where these oceans are. And just a fun little faxies, by the way, uh, the Southern Ocean did not, like, be, was not considered an ocean until maybe a few years ago, which is pretty wild. Um, and then a super uh, separate uh, fun faxies about me is I am the youngest of... 13 siblings. You heard that right, my friends. I am the youngest of 13 siblings. Um, we'll probably touch more on that later, but here we are. So just to consider, uh, once again, the sizes of these oceans. Um, sorry, my face is covering the Earth's surface, but, you know, the ocean's about 71% of our Earth's surface. Land is about 30. You know, that number is variable. It's, it's really quite interesting, you know, considering land masses that are built by volcanoes or Earth's movement, plate tectonics, um, but you know, we don't really have like a whole lot of sinking of land into the ocean, but it's it's pretty interesting, you know, it's a little bit of an old statistic, but kind of interesting to see. And also this graphic shows quite nicely um, how the Southern Ocean was left out. So this is an old graphic from some lecture slides from a while ago. So just to kind of showcase the relative size here on the bottom left uh, pie chart. And then what I really also like here on the right is 
how deep the oceans can be in comparison to each other. So the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Ocean, all relatively the same depth, about 4,000 meters or four kilometers, whereas the Arctic Ocean is a mere thousand meters or only just a kilometer. So pretty, pretty tiny. And then comparing that to the average elevation of land. And this is a similar but slightly different graphic, um, just also showcasing the Mariana Trench. What we believe to be the deepest part of our oceans is about 1100 or yeah, 1100 meters. No, sorry, 11,000 meters, <laughs> uh, about 11 kilometers, um, which is way, way, way deeper than the average depth of our oceans. And just once again, comparing that to the average height of land uh, versus our highest above water mountain peak, which is Mount Everest. Um, so it's all kind of really interesting things, kind of just kind of introducing ourselves to these um, little ideas. And in our next video, I will introduce the idea of uh, the inner workings of our planet and this idea of plate tectonics. So thanks so much for watching this first vid. I will uh, look forward to seeing your responses. Thanks.